Hey everyone, uh, we're going to go over today um, some basic vent stuff and then I'm going to show you what I do every day uh, to set this vent up so it's a pre-connect for you for every single adult patient you could uh, ever have. So uh, we'll just go over it from the beginning and we'll start with the setup. Uh, remember, it's easy to set up because you can't put it in the wrong place. So just keep moving down, you'll get it um, to fit in the right place. You can't put them in the wrong place. The one trick with these two is you got to give it a little back twist. When you give it that back twist, it allows it to self tighten itself on and then it won't self loosen. So just remember that. Um, and then what I like to do is I like to flip to my uh, uh, vent book and then I just follow along with the picture. So let's talk about everything that's on the pictures and go over that. So this is our meter dose inhaler adapter. Where does it go? It goes on the inhalation side. How do we know the inhalation side on this? Well, I think of it as the long tube that goes from the vent all the way up. You can also look at where these cords or wires or tubes are pointing. And then also this coupling looks different and it's easier to remove. So that's where this goes. We put that on, put it on there. We would put our meter dose inhaler on here. And when we're giving that medication, remember we have the ability to hit this tiny manual breath button down here to synchronize it so we can hit breath, breath to give that full dose, the two puffs, which equals a dose of medication. With that, remember we can't have our HME passed here because if we have our HME passed here, it will catch the medication. So we have to remove that. That's why we would prefer you to use this meter dose inhaler because we just have to do two breaths then we can put the HME back on rather than an SVN where we'd have to have it on for 10 to 15 minutes without the HME. Sound good? So with that being said, we don't need to put this on every single patient. We only need to put this on the patient that we say, hey, I want to give them a little bit more to open up those lungs so we don't often have this on. So we usually have this off and then let's talk about what's next. What's next is our HME. We have our HME. This is our heat moisture exchange. What this does is it catches our first exhaled breath that's hot and humid and recycles it back and forth to the patient. Why is that important? Well, that's important because we just put a tube down their throat. We bypass their oral and nasal pharynx. Our oral, our oral and nasal pharynx heat, humidify, um, and filter the air that goes in. So we've just taken away that ability for them. So when we have this in and we're pumping in cold dry air if we have any lung butter or anything going on we could really dry that out and give them a bad pneumonia so this keeps everything the way that it's supposed to be in that environment the other thing it does is remember it filters out that medicine and it also filters out whatever sickness or or nastiness that they have and it stops that from us being exposed to it so i like putting that on next thing we put on is our end title we put on our end title here and what this tells us is, hey, this is telling us how fast or slow they're breathing. It tells us that our tube is still good. So it gives us lots of information. Uh, the next thing that we usually put on is our Ballard suction. Put our Ballard suction on, and then we hook this up to our test line. Then, in a real scenario, while we're over here innovating somebody, we innovate them. We have an end title on here. We make sure that everything's working good here. We make sure that everything's working good with our uh, ventilator. Then we're ready to transfer over. Some people might take that end title off and then try and figure out, look at the picture, figure out exactly where it goes here and be messing with all these things. I don't really like that because this is gonna be alarming at you. The patient's not gonna be breathing. What I like to do is I like to just take that end title off, throw it away, keep a second end title on here all ready to go, then you quickly transfer it over right from your test line. Some people might ask, hey, it looks like we can set this up in any configuration that we want. Why don't we just keep the end title on the ET tube and put this right on top? Well, that works to breathe for them, but if you look down there, you've got the prongs in the way where you can't get the suction through the prongs. So that takes that out. And some people say, well, why do we need this um, Ballard suction? We've already got this elbow that's always attached to your uh, ventilation tubing. 
why don't I just use that? This gives me the elbow so it's not sticking straight out from the patient. Why is this important? Well, this is important because while we're sitting here on the patient, we're completely isolated from the patient and the patient is completely isolated from us. If we do have something in here, some uh, mucus, some sputum, some blood that we need to suction out, now I have to somehow suction this out. So I have to pop this open, get a suction catheter, suction it down, expose everybody to this, and then put it back on, and then I'd have to do it over and over again. With the Ballard suction, we have the ability to suction, keep everybody isolated from each other, and then suction on the way out, and then you can use it over and over again, and we always know where it is. So that's why we like to have this set up. I don't set this up every day. Um, I just set it up when it's on a patient, but it's good to look at all the pieces of this setup because this is one of the most complicated setups that we have, okay? So now what I'm gonna show you is what I do every day. So I set up this every day with a test circuit. This test circuit, I use over and over and over again, but I never put it on a patient, but I just have it at the station. I put that test circuit onto my test lung and have everything connected. And then I flip open my ventilator book to the invasive innovated setup. So with that, I just follow along here and read what it says, and I'll show you what I'm doing there. So what I do, the first thing I do is I turn it on and it's always gonna beep at us. It's always gonna beep at us. And the reason it's beeping at us at first is because it's telling us that there is an external power loss. What it means is, hey, I'm not plugged in. It's used to being plugged into a system. You have to hit the silence button to silence it out, and then you have to hit it again to clear out that alarm. So you have to hit it a few times to silence and then clear out that alarm. And then once it clears out, it should be good to go. Now what I do is I follow along with my paper here. It says, scroll to new patient in the red. So I scroll to new patient and then I hit select. Then I scroll to patient size and I hit select. And then I scroll to adult, hit select, and then I pick innovated. Now, if that's as far as we got, this is better than all of us with a bag valve mask. Us with a bag valve mask, we get a D. This right now is getting a B. But remember, all we did was this part here, and this is an open book test. So just keep going down and you'll get it all the way to an A+. So the next thing we do is we take our breath mode. We bring our breath mode down to SIMV. So we're in assist control and I bring it down to SIMV. I click it, it starts blinking. Now I can move it and then I have to double check my work and click it again. Now I'm in SIMV. The only thing that changes is this. This pops up, it's my pressure support breath. So the difference between assist controlled and SIMV is this pressure support breath. What that means is in SIMV, if the patient takes their own baby guppy breath, then this will give them a little help with that and it'll be a little bit more comfortable. If they were still in assist control when they took a breath, then the machine would give them a full machine breath and it wouldn't be as comfortable. It wouldn't hurt them, but SIMV is more comfortable. So that's why we have them in that mode. Next, we take them down to breath type. Breath type, we wanna go down to PRVC. So right now it's in volume mode. What that means is this is highlighted and whatever volume I select here, that's what the ventilator will give them and it doesn't care what pressure it takes to get there. I can also pressure ventilate them. You see how this goes away? Now the pressure just pops up. So now it's giving a pressure of 15 centimeters of water and it doesn't care what volume that equals. PRVC is mashing those two together. So that's pressure regulated volume control. That's where I can type in whatever volume I want, and the machine's gonna try and give that, but it's gonna try and give it with the least amount of pressure possible. So that's really nice to our patients. So that's why we set that up. Next, it says in my sheet that I wanna turn my O2 up to 100%. And now I would turn this up if I was on an actual patient, but right now I'm just checking the vent off in the morning, like on the back of the truck. So if I turn this on, all that will happen is if I'm plugged into O2, I'm gonna suck the O2 down. Or if I'm not plugged into O2, it's just gonna alarm at me. So I'm just gonna to remember to do this as my last step. Now I come down here to this red section. All of these are my alarms. 
And if you understand how to manipulate this, then the vent is going to be your friend, specifically this alarm right here. So the way I manipulate this alarm and the way I think about it is, this is saying that on average, an adult needs three liters of air to survive. Well, we're not going on an average adult. Somebody already called 911 because something was wrong with them. We all got there and decided they needed to go on the vent. So they're really a sick patient. We don't need the vent to once we put them on to say, alarm, 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 this person's really sick. That's not helpful to us. What this is designed for is it's designed for nurses to set somebody up on a vent and then go to another room and set somebody else up and go to another room. They want the vent to say, hey, something's going on with this patient. They're sicker. You need to come on back. We're never leaving our patient. So initially what we can do with this is we can take it off our plate. Initially, I like to click it and take this down to point one. And then later on, oh, sorry. Later on in the call, later on in the call, I can come up here to this section and find out what their actual minute ventilation is and then turn this on to be just under that so that I'm using it to my advantage. So I turn it down to 0 0.1 uh, and then that takes it off my plate. That's like 95% of my alarms that I don't have to worry about. Then I come over here to this section. This section is these two alarms up here. So it's my two orange lines up here and I can manipulate these. If you see up here, you can see that the pressure goes past the orange line and then a little bit below and past the orange line and a little bit below. That can start to cause alarms, especially when we've got them hooked up to all of this, there's a little bit more leaks going through here than this system. So you can have a few more alarms. So I like to take this alarm and widen it out so that it catches all of those highs and low pressures. So the lowest pressure in this system is my pressure of six, which is my peep. So I want this to be two below that. So I'm gonna bring this down to four. So I click it, it highlights it. I bring it down to four. Now, if I forget to double check my work and click it in, what happens? Everything goes back to where it is. And it's a little bit irritating, but that's why it's important to set this up every day as a pre-connect. And it gives you that sets and reps and practice, kind of like doing a, a pump check on your truck, just giving you the that repetition. So I don't want this to be 65, so that will eventually go away and drop off or I can click something else and it will go away. So I bring it down here to four and I double check my work and click it in. Now let's talk about this alarm. This alarm is the only alarm that I like initially. It's set up for an adult to say that above 40 centimeters of water, you could really start causing harm to these patients. You could start popping their lungs. I don't wanna pop anybody's lungs. So with this being in place, is it's saying the vent will ventilate right up until 40 but it won't go above that, it won't harm the patient. So if this alarm is going off, it's saying that anything above this could be harmful to the patient, so you should figure out what's going on. So if I've just made a change up here, well maybe I don't need to make that change if it's high pressure limiting them. Maybe I can back that change off. If it comes out of the blue, well I need to look at the patient and look at all my tools. I could say, hey, is there something in the tube that I need to suction out? Is that why it's high pressure limiting? I need to suction that out. Or maybe the last time I suctioned it out, I forgot to pull this all the way out of the tube and that's why I'm high pressure limiting. So I need to make sure that that's pulled all the way out. It could also just be as simple as, hey, it's kinked. Or this could have slipped down, further down the airway and now it's in the right main stem and I'm only ventilating one lung when I used to be ventilating two. So I need to back this up so that I'm ventilating two lungs again. You could also have things happen with this, where this is kinked. Or you could have something happening with your patient where their lungs truly are collapsed or you need to position them differently. So this gives me a lot of information about what the patient needs. Now I come up here to this section. I turn this one down to what ACLS recommends to start at 10. And that's like our little blinky timer on our bag of mess. So I think about all of this stuff up here. All of this green section is what we do with a bag valve mask, but we're not very good at. Remember, we get a D. Because all we can really think about is this breath rate. So if I'm sitting here and I pull my blinky timer and I'm really concentrated on breathing for the patient, I can sit here and say, breathe, wait for my blinky timer. Nobody talk to me because I'm concentrated on my blinky timer, breathe. And then somebody says, hey, where's the drug box? I'm like, oh, dude, I brought the drug box in. And I think it's in the room behind the, oh, shoot, did I just miss a breath? Because I can get distracted. This machine 
never gets distracted. It's always doing this. We as people can get distracted and not even do a very good job of this. On top of that, was I doing an inspiration time of one full second so that we had good gas exchange for this patient? Probably not. Do I have any idea how many CCs I'm giving with every single breath? No. Do I have anything in place so that I don't pop their lungs and go above a pressure of 40? No. Do I have the capability to feel a tiny little change in pressure and give them a little pressure support breath to help with them if they're having a little breathing? No. And then do I always remember to put on a peep valve? Probably not. So this takes a lot of things off of our plate that makes it easier for us. The other thing too is when we understand how to manipulate the alarms, this machine doesn't beep at us anymore. So it gives me my whole crew back where we can do other things with patient care and we can let this do what it's really good at. So I would call this a good vent check because I've got everything set up the way that I want it except for my O2 and everything's working. So the last thing I want to do is I want to turn my O2 up um, and then it will be a pre-connect. So when I turn the O2 up, it says for an innovative patient to set it at 100%. And it says for a non-innovative patient, NPPV, to set at 50%. And then all of this other stuff is basically saying, hey, titrate up or down based on what your patient needs. So since I'm setting it up for all of my adult patients, I like to set it at 50% and then just decide to go up or down from there, whatever the patient needs. This also gives me the ability to say, hey, if I'm in the back of a nursing home, my oxygen bottle is going to last twice as long if I started at 50 than if I started at 100%. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it up to 100%, or I'm sorry, 50%, crank it up to 50, and then I got to remember to double check my work and click it in. And I'm going to know that it's going to alarm at me when I do this. But that's okay because I'm just going to turn it off. So I click it in. Now I turn off the vent and I say, hey, that was a good vent check. Now let's see how that pre-connect works. So we set that up in the morning. So set that up every single morning. And then when you do have that call, that's a um, innovated call, knowing that you set it up for it, you can set it up. I like to come here, grab my uh, vent book. I like to send somebody into the ambulance if you can. Have them double check your pictures, set everything up, hook up to the O2 in the ambulance so that you have a big supply. Then I have them flip to the invasive innovated again, and now I'm just gonna double check my work to make sure it's working. So I'm in a more controlled environment, and I know that I set this up in a super controlled environment because there wasn't even a call. I could take as long as I want in the morning. So I turn it on, it's going to alarm at me. So I silence it out and clear it out. Once I've silenced and cleared out the external power loss, then I get to this section. Since I set it up in the morning, now I can pick same patient. What picking same patient does is it skips all of this red scroll stuff and it goes right to two choices. It's already saying, hey, you're an adult. Is it innovated or is it an adult not innovated? So those are my two choices. So right now we're saying, hey, we're going on an adult innovative patient. We click that in and then now I double check my work. So it says, hey, our breath rate's at 10, SIMV, PRVC. It's set at 50% and all my alarms are there. It's alarming at me right now because it's set at 50% oxygen and I'm not plugged into anything. If I was plugged in, no alarms. So everything's the same, just like a pre-connect, and I got to do it that much faster. So now we could transfer over. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off and show you how it's a pre-connect for my non-invasive. So my non-invasive ones are, we follow along with this picture here with the mask, and I forgot the mask. I'm going to pause it and I'll go get the mask. Keep going. Okay. So we got the mask here. Um, and we can set this up and we would do all of the same thing. So we'd set it up based on a picture. And then I would flip it to my NPPV mode. And then I'm just going to double check my work here. So the same thing again. I like to get um, in the ambulance if we can. Or if we're just with a patient and hook up to RO2. Then I turn it on. Then I can silence it out. Thank you. Then I can silence it out. And then while we're sitting here, I pick same patient. Even though I only set it up for an innovative patient, it's going to set it up for all of my adult patients. So I'm going to pick same patient. And then I have two choices, either innovated or not innovated. 
So I go to not innovated. This is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And I flip to that on here. And what this is going to do is it's going to skip all of this if I've set it up in the morning. And I just have to do my double check. And I do have to make one change with the breath mode. So I hit this. I select it in. And then the one change I need to make is my breath mode. I need to switch it from CPAP plus pressure port to assist controlled. This makes it better and easier for us. And I'll explain that in a minute because this pops on right there. So this makes it easier for us, but it already popped me into pressure and it kept me at 50% and all of my alarms are here. Once again, it's alarming at me because my O2 is at 50%. So I'm going to turn that down so we can talk about MPPV a little bit. So I bring it down here, clear it out, silence it out. And now let's talk about MPPV. So non-invasive NPPV, BiPAP, CPAP, they're all basically saying the same things. And it's basically these two pressures here, which give me my BiPAP pressure. So these two pressures, the way I think of them is I think of them like my um, irons. So when I have my irons and I go up to a big metal door and I start working on it with the halogen, if I forget to put my wedge in the door and I just work with my halogen and work, 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 I don't necessarily open up the door. Um, so I need to have that wedge to keep what I gain. So Let's talk about when we would use NPPV. So we would use NPPV on a bunch of different patients. The quintessential patients are your CHFers, your COPDers, and then anybody who's actually tired. How does this help with my CHFers? Well, my CHFers, their lungs are filled up with fluid, and that means that their alveolar sacs are filled up with fluid. And the fastest way to get that fluid out is to push it out with pressure so that we can get gas exchange to happen. Same thing with my COPDers. The COPDers, their alveolar sacs are collapsed and we need to pop them open with pressure so we can have gas exchange. Now we also have anybody who's just actually in respiratory distress and is tired. They've been working so hard to breathe that they just need help with that. So what the NPPV will do is when it feels them start to take a breath, it gives them that positive pressure that just takes that work of breathing off. So we get back to my Halligan and Irons analogy is, Hey, I'm work, work, working on that. I, if I forget to put that wedge in, then I probably didn't get the door. If I remember to put the wedge in, then it keeps what I gain. So what I mean by that is the P is my wedge. So if, the, if I'm thinking about those alveolar sacs that are filled up with fluid, now I push that out with, the, with that pressure, and then the P keeps what I gain so it doesn't fill back up. So it keeps what I gain, and then it pushes all that fluid out that much faster. Then I can have good gas exchange. The same thing happens on my COPDers, except their alveolar sacs are collapsed and I can pop it open with pressure and then this back pressure of P keeps it open. Then I can recruit more and more and more alveolar sacs to pop open for more and more gas exchange. Now, I usually don't think about my wedge too much. I put it in place and then I work on the halogen. The only time that I would think about this is if they're a really bad COPD. So if they're a really bad COPD, then I might need to increase this to eight to maybe 10, but not much more than that. And if you forget that and you are just working with this pressure, you're still gonna do a lot of benefit to the patient. You're not gonna hurt the patient. This just helps those COPDers pop open more and more alveolar sacs. So usually what I'm working off is just this pressure control. So the way I think about that is the halogen adding more pressure, less pressure. I can kind of wiggle it around to get that door open. The other way I think about this pressure control is like an engineer, an engineer pumping a firefighter's line. So if the firefighter's getting lifted up in the air, the engineer doesn't go, that's the pump discharge pressure, you're going to have to deal with it. What they'll usually do is they'll back that pressure off, wait till a few more firefighters get there, and then they can crank that pressure up. That's the same thing we can do here. So if we've got a little old lady who's trying to put this on because she's got fluid in her lungs, and we put it on and she's just going, we wouldn't say, hey, little old lady, you got to deal with it. You got fluid in your lungs. That's the pressure. We would say, hey, you know what? I can come to this pressure control. I can dial this back a little bit until you're comfortable with it. And we can get that pressure on and put it on, tighten it up. And then now I can slowly increase this pressure by one or two at a time. So I can increase the pressure as it's feeling good and pushing that fluid out, opening up alveolar sacs and helping you breathe. Then we can work it up. Remember, what it says in here is use caution when you're exceeding a pressure of 26. What that means is the two of these together 
when you get close to 26, use caution because you can start to see their blood pressure start to drop. Well, why is their blood pressure dropping? Well, their blood pressure is dropping because inside your chest cavity, you have your lungs and your heart. Right now, what I'm doing is I'm pushing pressure of air and oxygen into the lungs. My goal is, is to get oxygen into the lungs, to get that oxygen into the blood, to get it into the heart, to get it out to the body. But when I'm pushing all of this pressure, if those lungs are squeezing down on the heart and decreasing my blood pressure, then I'm defeating the whole purpose. So if I start to see that my blood pressure is dropping, I'm, I'm kind of playing a teeter-totter game. I would rather have some water in my lungs and a good blood pressure rather than no water in my lungs and no, and no blood pressure that defeats the whole purpose of it. So that's what I want to do is I want to say, hey, if my blood pressure starts to drop, I'm just going to slow down and let them stay at that pressure because just time at that pressure will also be pushing the fluid out or opening up alveolar sacs. So the next thing I do, I think about this as my wedge. I don't use it too often. I work on my halogen or my pressure like an engineer giving more or less pressure. And then this one popped up when I brought it into assist control. So these are the two main buttons I use for NPPV. What this one does is it allows me to synchronize the machine, the machine, the ventilator to the patient. And what I mean by that is usually when you have a patient that's having difficulty breathing with CHF, COPD, or they're just tired, they're breathing really fast. And when somebody's breathing fast, they don't take long breaths, they take short breaths. They don't take deep breaths, they take shallow breaths. This button is how deep or shallow they're breathing. We kind of already talked about that, how we can lower the pressure. This button is how long or short they're breathing. And I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, hey, I put them on NPPV, um, and it seemed like they fought the machine the whole time. It alarmed at me. It said something about high F. What that means is high frequency, which means it's breathing fast. Uh, and then I'll usually, they'll usually say, hey, it didn't work, and I don't like using it. Uh, what I'll ask them is, hey, were they breathing really rapidly? And they'll say, yeah, they were breathing really rapidly. And I'll explain to them how that high F means that's what the machine's picking up. And what the machine is having trouble with, what the ventilator's having trouble with, is it needs one of these two things to be met. It needs a certain percentage of this to be met or a certain percentage of this to be met for it to stop breathing, for it to stop the breath. So if it doesn't have any of those met, it's not synchronized with the patient and the patient and the machine kind of fight. So we already talked about how we would lower this, but we can also lower this. If you know your patient is breathing really rapidly, like over 24 times a minute, they're not taking a full second to breathe, which is what it's set on. So you can shorten that down and you can say, hey, I'm gonna bring this down to 0.7. Now I've decreased this. I've decreased the how deep they're breathing. And then I get it onto their face and as they calm down and notice that the machine is now synchronized with them and helping, now we can increase this pressure to push out more fluid and open up alveolar sacs. Then as they calm down and start breathing slower, we can increase this inspiration time back to a full second so we have that good gas exchange happen. So with that being said, what I like to do is I like to set it up in that invasive innovated mode and now it's ready for every adult patient which is most of the patients that we go on by doing this every morning having somebody do this it gives you the sets and reps on this where you feel comfortable manipulating the machine then when you have any of these calls you feel more comfortable and then when you have your pediatric call you can line it up with your brazo tape and you're comfortable manipulating so you can just follow along and plug in everything uh, it's a lot of information uh, anybody in EMS would be happy to come out uh, and go over all of this again with you, get you some one-on-one uh, -on -one time and get hands on this and answer any questions you have. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can always email or call anybody at EMS. Thanks. Mm -hmm.